have no disclosures. So this patient is a 32-year-old male. He uh, pre presented to my clinic. He showed up in the clinic uh, on a stretcher, of course, during a very busy clinic. Um, he shows up in a stretcher. He had a, um, a traumatic brain injury that he was overcoming, um, still able to communicate with me that day, but um, still had some sequela from the traumatic brain injury. Uh, he had previously had an open book pelvis injury and a right femur fracture that they were treated um, at uh, one of the trauma centers, um, but he uh, had the left knee and an external fixator due to the uh, knee injury, the multi ligamentous knee injury. He also had a right perilunate dislocation that had not been managed yet um, when he saw me in the clinic, and he was six weeks out from his injury when he showed up in the clinic. Uh, so again, one of these that, that rolls into a sports medicine clinic uh, where I'm usually seeing you know, ACL injuries and uh, meniscus injuries and rotator cuffs and things like that. Now we have a true uh, uh, significant trauma uh, injury in patients. So, you know, you know, what do you do with this uh, when this comes into your clinic and how do you manage it? Um, so on exam, um, really unable to get much of a range motion or ligamentous exam because he is locked with the fixator in place, uh, but you are able to examine uh, his neurovascular uh, status um, and assess the uh, perineal nerve. Uh, fortunately, this patient still had a working perineal nerve, was able to perform a um, uh, distally was neurovascular intact. And this patient actually did not have any sort of vascular injury um, at the time of his original injury, which uh, was, was great. Um, so I uh, communicated, he already had another surgeon that was going to treat his uh, perilunate dislocation uh, with the proximal row corpectomy. Uh, I communicated with that surgeon and said, you know, when you're in the operating room, can you take the external fixator off? Um, and then uh, once we get the external fixator off, let's get an MRI of the knee and assess kind of where we're at at that point. Uh, this patient uh, came back to me about four weeks later, had the external fixator removed, he had a significant sag of the tibia on the femur with the obvious posterior drawer. Uh, he could not perform a straight leg rage, which, again, that was a little bit of a surprise to me based on the operative notes and his clinic notes and, or, and everything from the, um, from the hospital. Uh, the patella tendon rupture uh, was, uh, was definitely a surprise at that point. Um, and he had an unstable Lachman exam, uh, range of motion from about zero to 60 degrees. And he also had severe laxity to valgus stress in the knee. Um, not too much significant uh, stress to bear or laxity to bear stress of the knee. Um, so we got the MRI, and the MRI, as you can see, shows uh, this uh, chronic patella tendon rupture. Also has PCL rupture, ACL tear uh, of the knee. And so this is what we're dealing with: we're dealing with an ACL tear, a PCL tear, an MCL tear, medial meniscus, lateral meniscus. And of course, the most important thing is the patella tendon rupture from the tibia. You know, everything that I do for this patient, reconstructing his ligaments, um, a total knee replacement in, in, uh, in this patient is still on the table, um, you know, in a decade uh, or so, uh, or even earlier if he needs it, we, we've got that backup. But if he doesn't have a, a working extensor mechanism, then, then obviously, um, he's not going to have good function of his knee. So that's, that is the primary uh, goal here is to get his extensor mechanism working. Um, so I decided to do a staged approach uh, with the first stage uh, doing an MCL repair, actually with an internal brace and patella tendon repair with hamstring augmentation. Now there's a lot of decisions to make on that and what to do in terms of the MCL and the patella tendon. Um, the MCL um, in, in, you know, been in practice now about two years and, and, but in talking with my mentors and the MCL, the MCL reconstructions are, are just a very difficult, um, a chronic MCL tear can also be a very difficult thing to deal with. Um, and the internal brace has actually, um, been very helpful with these injuries. Um, in terms of, uh, you see a lot of late laxity with these injuries, if, if with a uh, reconstruction, with an allograft, Achilles agraft, and so forth. The MCL uh, re repair with an internal brace just allows you um, a significant easier procedure as long as you get that, in, uh, that MCL, uh, the internal brace, at a, a fairly isometric point, um, then you can actually get very good uh, stability of the MCL. And a lot of times there is tissue remaining 
on the medial side to repair, um, even in the late stage that you can, you can still find that tissue. Unlike the lateral side, the, the, the medial side, usually there is some, still some tissue to, re, uh, to repair, uh, to incorporate with that internal embrace. Now, in terms of the patella tendon, um, again, lots of different options on what you do at this point in terms of you can use allograft, Achilles allograft, try and reconstruct the entire extensor mechanism, um, or you can, uh, you know, attempt a primary repair or uh, do some sort of augmentation, which is what we chose to do in this case, to do a patella tendon repair, if there's any tissue to repair, and then augment it with a hamstring. And this is what um, uh, the procedure looked like. I think I've got a picture floating around somewhere, but I couldn't find it. Um, so first of all, um, as you can imagine, uh, getting into the case, we did a midline uh, longitudinal expose, uh, approach, just a midline approach to the knee. Um, and uh, there is significant patella alta, uh, as you would expect, uh, getting to this injury so late. Um, so uh, with releasing medial lateral gutters um, and uh, traction on the uh, patella, the patella still was not coming down to an appropriate location due to the um, uh, chronic nature of the condition. So decided to along with the patella tendon uh, reconstruction to perform a VOI plasty of the uh, extensor mechanism as well. Now, again, in doing so, you, you, there, you do have to be careful now that we have the uh, patella tendons out and the medial lateral gutters are, um, retinaculum are involved to an extent. So we have to be careful that we don't want to devascularize the patella. But um, in order to get this to come down, we were able to do a VOI plasty um, and allowed the patella to mobilize more inferiorly to get it into a proper location. Um, so that's the first thing that we did. Um, and then there was still some patella tendon tissue remaining. It had pulled off of the tibia, which was advantageous for this patient. Um, and so we placed uh, suture anchors um, at the tibial footprint. Um, and then um, I really like, um, a lot of times I'll still use soft suture anchors uh, like either fiber tax or iconics uh, striker iconics and, and I've had really good success with these um, I like to place them and then I'll crack out one end up and down the tendon use the other end just go through the end of the tendon um, And then it allows you to really cinch down the tendon to the location um, So I did two of those at the tibial footprint ran those up and down and got the patella tendon pretty much as far down as I could There's still a small gap uh, present there and then uh, we harvested the hamstring tendons, I actually harvested both tendons, semitendinosus and the gracilis, um, and then uh, took the, the semitendinosus, ran it up. Um, I like to keep it on the medial side, so kept it up on the medial side, drilled a hole through the middle of the patella uh, for the uh, semitendinosus, ran it through the patella, then back around underneath through a hole underneath the uh, tibial tubercle. Uh, and then tied it to itself uh, on the medial side. I also added for some more stability, added a interference screw uh, at where it's inserting onto the tibia. The other nice thing that, that you have here is that you do still have the gracilis available, which is a lot of good collagen. Um, and also it allows you to kind of dress up the, uh, the semi-T reconstruction. So um, took the, uh, the gracilis and ran it around kind of in this cruciate uh, formation here uh, to kind of pull the uh, semitendinosus closer towards midline. Um, and also, uh, it adds quite a bit of collagen inferiorly um, at the footprint in the tibia where, where most of the defect was. So once this was complete, you have a really uh, robust repair, but also really nice uh, coverage, of quite a bit of collagen uh, throughout proximally and distally uh, at the extensor mechanism. So we did a uh, rehabilitation immediately after surgery, allowed the patient to weight bearers tolerated in a hinge knee brace uh, locked in extension. Um, and I usually like to try and get these patients moving pretty quickly. I, I trust the repair, even in a situation like this, uh, try and get them moving. Um, and usually by about six weeks, I like to get them to about 90 degrees. Uh, in this patient, obviously a lot of scarring, a eight weeks uh, range of motion from about zero to 60 degrees. And he could perform a straight leg raise uh, at that point 
uh, which was which was excellent. He, uh, knee was actually quite stable to valgus stress, but he was still grossly unstable to AP stress because he still had the ACL and PSL injury. We got a post-op uh, MRI at that point, both for planning for the next stage and also to evaluate uh, our repair. And you can see here where the uh, semitendinosus is going through. And you can see that we've restored uh, both the height of our patella uh, and then um, a uh, pretty good um, uh, restoration of the patella tendon at that point as well. So about three months post, I gave him a lot of time to try and rehab, get as much motion as we could. He was making progress, but still kind of reached about a, a plateau at about um, uh, three months post-op, zero to 75 degrees. Still very unstable AP stress, um, decided to proceed with the ACL PCL reconstruction. This is what that looked like. So a significant scarring in the back of the knee. It was just a bunch of concrete in, in the back of his knee there. Um, but we were able to release all of that with a uh, cautery, uh, working through the posterior portals. Um, and here you can see where a guide for the PCL is here, hooked over the back of the tibia. Um, did an all inside uh, approach with allografts, both for the PCL and ACL. Um, and, uh, had a, you know, really nice reconstruction for this patient. Um, and, uh, we were able to get a, a good stable knee. The other thing at the time of the surgery, which made this very difficult because of his range of motion, um, uh, really kind of difficult to be working there, but we were able to release, uh, quite a bit while we we're in, in doing the case. Um, most significantly, if you have a patient with a lot of, uh, inability to to flex the knee um working in that superior um uh super patella area uh, is where you can get a lot of um make a lot of gains in terms of motion so if you can just get a, a cautery probe kind of poke through the scarring that's up there superiorly um and then just create a little bit of window and then you can start working medial and lateral from that window to just clear all of that scar and in doing so, if you do that and kind of work down both gutters, once you manipulate the knee after that, you can get a lot of uh, motion. And that's what, exactly what happened in this patient. So we we're actually able to get greater than 90 degrees of motion by the end of the case. So we had a successful ACL and PCL reconstruction, release adhesions, it got into about 100 degrees. Two weeks post-op, again, very stiff at that point, um, despite you know, trying to continue to work on his motion, but the knee was very stable. Four months post-op, range of motion uh, to about 80, 85 degrees or so. The knee was very stable. He was walking around unaided, uh, very good strength in his uh, extensor mechanism. Uh, and he was overall pretty happy with this, but still not able to get quite to 90 degrees of flexion, so decided to perform lysis adhesions. Actually did this uh, fairly recently, a couple of weeks ago. We did lysis adhesions uh, in an MUA. I uh, did the technique that I uh, just uh, discussed with you, really working superior uh, Lee and got him to about 120 degrees of motion um, uh, during the case. So, and got him right into therapy right afterwards. So I'm going to see him post-op next week. We'll see what he's got. Um, but overall, you know, pretty good result at this point for this patient, a very difficult injury. You know, and there's been some studies on this. This is a good review, um, looking at all the different reconstruction techniques that are available. Um, and, and the big takeaway is that, you know, you do need to do something. You've got a reconstruction is significantly better than primary repair. So don't be uh, tricked into, even if you feel like you can get the tendon pretty close, um, definitely at least augment with some, some other tissue. Uh, and that's what, that's what they found over and over again, that reconstructions do better um, in these late cases than just primary repair. So you've got to put some more collagen there of some sort. I prefer autograph um, in these cases. And then uh, here's, a ipsilateral, uh, here's a study with ipsilateral hamstring tendon graft reconstruction. Uh, this was just a case review of 19 patients. 14 of the 19 were very satisfied, all returned back to their normal activities and range of motion had improved for these patients. And this is what their reconstruction looked like. They actually take the hamstring, they go across first. So they kind of take from the medial side, go over to the lateral side and kind of come across and they get that kind of cruciate shape from the semitendinosis. Uh, either way is, is good. I kind of like uh, to, to bring up the sides a little bit and then pull it together, but it's just kind of a dealer's choice. Uh, the main thing is that you're getting the good stability um, and also um, a lot of collagen, good, um, fresh, uh, healthy collagen uh, for the patient. Uh, so I really appreciate it. Um, difficult cases, difficult uh, um, um, uh, cases, 
uh, in, in you know these chronic ruptures, but they can do really well um, with this approach. Thank you.